Welcome, everybody. Very excited about today's show. I'm going to introduce you to someone who uh, figured large into my experience out in the Wadi Rum Desert. You'll be seeing us. He's a principal figure in uh, the Special Forces show we did. You'll see that on Fox this January, where uh, we were essentially special ops recruits. And uh, the actual Special, special Forces trainers uh, had their way with us. And Ramey was one of those people. But we are not here to talk about that today. We'll, we'll of course, clue you in. We'll tell you his story. But to get the full story, you have to go to drdrew.com and see the Dr. Drew podcast where he and I review his whole story in great detail, which we'll sort of thumbnail a bit today. Remy Adelike has a new project. It is uh, shining a light on human trafficking and organ harvesting. Susan and Caleb have both been exposed to the project and are shaken by it. There it is, the unexpected. Uh, we're going to talk about where you can get that, where you can see that right after this. Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin. Ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome, everybody. I'm, of course, following you over on the Restream as well as out on the Rumble at the Rumble Rant. And I'm watching the Twitter spaces where we will be taking your calls a little bit later. Uh, in fact, if you're interested, I don't know how we're going to parse these out. I may let you ask Remy a few questions as well. Remy Adelike is a decorated member of the military, served 13 years as a U.S. Navy SEAL. Uh, the many extraordinary aspects about him being a Navy SEAL, not the least of which, prior to becoming a SEAL, he did not know how to swim. And, uh, oh, there we go. Sorry that that keeps happening. I do, that happens to me even when I put the block on my uh, thing here. Did so you shut weird. off the sound? Yes, it's very weird. Too. There is his book, Transformed. And uh, he was indeed transformed, but um, I'm going to let him tell a little bit that that story. And most importantly, today we're going to talk about the book about human trafficking. Remy spent uh, early childhood as Nigerian royalty. He will tell you that story till the death of his father uh, and that his mother came to live in the Bronx. And he has an astonishing story of uh, transformation, again, in Transformed, a Navy SEAL's unlikely journey from the throne of Africa to the streets of the Bronx to defying all odds, uh, all the way to being, you know, <laughs> to finding him in the Wadi Rum Desert of Jordan. Uh, Ramey Adelike, welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. Hey, and thank you for your service hey, as well. So let me say, uh, let me say something. Thank you for having something, me something you'll hear him say more oh, than yeah, once. Yeah. You'll hear this. You'll, you'll hear this a couple of times uh, while he, we're out there yeah. in the desert with him. Uh, and uh, it's something that, uh, yeah, we all pay the man. That's what we do. Uh, <laughs> You know what's interesting? I was I was guy watching. Guy. That's right. I was watching uh, the uh, new the new uh, Top Gun film. I was on a plane yesterday. I watched it, and I noticed uh, they they were used a familiar language when they were getting shot down in their war games. They would just go fail, fail, fail. I was like, oh, fail. Oh no, what are we gonna have to do? <laughs> it's like, and then they got the push ups. Then they got the push ups. I thought, yeah, okay, yeah. I know what that is. Fail. You hear that word and you're like, oh, what's next? It's going to be something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, tell them if you don't mind. The, the Again, I refer everyone, go to drdrew.com and get the Dr. Drew podcast, which dropped today, where we go into great detail about Remy's life. And uh, we'll get into just, I said, a thumbnail of it now, but I want mostly today to just talk about the, the movie and how to get it. Let's just state it up front. Where do they find the movie? What's it about? Where do they get it? And then we'll tell a little thumbnail about you. Uh, the movie can be found on YouTube uh, tonight at 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, that's 12 uh, a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, just go to my YouTube channel, Remy Adeleke, uh, or you could just search The Unexpected Film. Uh, that's where it will be. The Unexpected Film. I'm, go I'm going to do it right now to make sure it is really easy. Unexpected. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh what boy. might be easier is to just go to drdrew.com. Yeah, okay. if you just go to Remy at a uh, YouTube channel, just go to Remy at a YouTube yeah. channel, hit subscribe. That'll make life easier. 
There you go. Or go to drdrew.com and we have all the links there. So okay. we have it right, right. on your do page. Do that because if you if you Google, if you fill in a Google, you know, search, it other stuff starts flying in the way of it. So yeah, do that. Come to our page, link through, or go to Remy's page and link through. Drew likes to get those plugs out of the way. So Well, no, I want to make sure that you know anyone that's here hears it and we'll tell them again and we'll tell them again because I want them to go see this thing. Exactly. And, well, it's start it's it's dropping tomorrow, right? To, then nine o'clock tonight. Is that right? Tonight? Nine o'clock tonight. Yeah. Yes. Nine o'clock the same so time. So midnight, midnight Eastern time. So it's tomorrow, technically in the east. It's nine o'clock tonight here. And Susan, uh, just to put one more plug out there, you saw the trailer. Is that what you saw? I think so. And it, well, no, I saw the first episode. I think or and, parts of it. It was she, very well done. And she freaked out. Really interesting, but oh yeah, just <laughs> it's it. it Enter at your own risk. You know, it's really good, yeah. but it's it's also frightening and it's an eye-opening experience. So you have to, and, you know, reality is just something that everybody needs to experience. Well, yeah. And, okay, let's let's talk about Remy first. We'll talk about how he got into this topic in just a minute. But give them, give them the thumbnail on your story again, where you came from, how, how you evolved, how you ended up where you are now. Quick, quick, cool. I'll try to do this in under two minutes. So I was born into riches and wealth in Nigeria. My dad was a well-known Nigerian engineer, philanthropist, businessman, you name it, he did it. Uh, so when I came along, I came along into riches. Uh, he was also chief in the Yoruba tribe, which is the status of royalty. Uh, however, in 1987, the Nigerian government stripped our family of absolutely everything. And my dad died days later, sending us from very, very rich to very, very poor. Uh, my mom being an American, she was like, there's no way I'm raising my two kids here in Nigeria. So she permanently relocated my brother and I to the United States. And as I kind of began to grow up, I got involved in a lot of bad activities, started out stealing from my mom, and that progressed to stealing from stores, that progressed to stealing from jobs, that progressed to selling drugs. And then before you knew it, I was 19 and running high-level scams. I was totally influenced by the street life and street culture. And up getting involved in a deal with a drug dealer that went bad, I sold him some products that were supposed to last for a certain amount of time, only lasted for a fraction of that time. And... Uh, he came and threatened my life. And at the same time, there were people getting prosecuted and sent to federal prison. In 2002, I uh, made the decision to join the Navy. Um, couldn't swim, didn't have the academic scores and was skinny as a whip, but I said I wanted to be a frog man. Uh, although I had two warrants out for my arrest, which the recruiter discovered, and she took me to both judges and had both judges expunge my record. And then she went a, st a step further and fudged the paperwork to sneak me into the Navy. She would die two years later, but it was that one act that she did for me to totally changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, that she got to got to boot camp, got into SEAL training. It was the hardest thing I ever went through in my entire life. Uh, the class that I eventually I don't know what, you, I know what you're talking about. I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm confused. What do you... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to, I went to uh, you, you guys had Bud's Light. I had Bud's Heavy. Basic underwater demolition SEAL training. <laughs> exactly. And uh, the class that I graduated started with 270, only 29 of us graduated, which is the same for every class attrition rate is about 80 to 90 percent. And, you know, eventually became a frog man and had a chance to travel the world and do cool things and uh, operate and kick down doors and work on the intelligence side of things, human, which is human intelligence. So I got to kind of see behind the curtain a little bit as it related to intelligence gathering and, uh, and three letter agencies. and. Spent 13 and a half years in, got out in 2016, and that's when my journey into Hollywood kind of started. And, and I, I don't actually really know a lot of detail about that, so I'm going to have you tell that story a little bit too, but I just want to put a highlight on two things. So your intelligence training, you know, I, I think is really cool and interesting, and it, yeah. it kind of shined through to me a little bit when we you were training us. I, I, I could feel that understanding operating it's it's subtle but it, i i kind of know it when i see it number one and then number two let's let's state that recruiter's name because that woman literally took you by the hand went in front of the judges with you made the you know laid herself on the line to get these to literally say i'm going to put this boy in the navy give him a chance two different yeah. judges and got them both to comply yeah Tiana Nadine Reyes, that's her name. And uh, my daughter is somewhat named as a variation. So my daughter's name is Siana because Tiana's daughter's mm. name is Sierra. So we combine Sierra and, and, and Tiana to name my daughter Siana and my daughter's middle name is Reyes. Uh, Tiana's last name was Reyes. So that's the way we pay homage. But Tiana Nadine Reyes, 
if you are blessed by my film or by the things I've done in, in this country or even, you know, by the TV stuff, just you can give the credit to Tiana because I would not be here without that decision she made. And it's, to me, that's uh, there's a lot of breathtaking part of your story, but that, that's one of the moments where I'm like, oh my God, this woman. I mean, she, yeah. wow. So tell me about the, your career in media. I, I obviously know, know some of it, but how, where is yeah. it? Where, where's your main stuff? Where can they find you? I know you do a lot of the uh, technical advising too. So tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was kind of where I started. You know, after I got out in uh, 2016, I was actually in grad school getting my master's in organizational strategy slash business. And uh, I was at my desk one day, May of 2016, just writing papers and my phone rang. And on the other end of the phone was a woman who worked for Michael Bay. And uh, she said, hey, Bay's looking for somebody with your background to work on Transformers the last night. And I said, sure, I, I don't have anything going on. I'm just writing papers. So one day turned into three weeks and three weeks turned into six months on that film. And that's where my career began to kind of my life began to go down the direction of film and TV. I started consulting and acting on other projects, and then that kind of morphed into writing after I wrote my book, my memoir, Transform, which I didn't have a ghostwriter, co-writer, I wrote it myself. And then that kind of transposed into writing screenplays, which uh, turned into me producing stuff, which turned into me hosting stuff, which turned into me now writing and directing uh, this film uh, uh, on human trafficking and then the feature version, which hopefully will happen soon. So now what are we doing here? Here's a, I'm, I'm looking at a three book deal. Is that still happening? You got the, is that yeah. since the original book? Wow. Yeah. So awesome. I just right signed now? that deal. That, yeah. Well, but we, I just turned in book one uh, about a month ago and my, my publisher just emailed me today, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, a right. marketing pitch to the marketers. So I turned in the book and we're, we're done. I'm done with, with editing and everything. So that's going to be, we're releasing right. that next year. It's going to be a big growth. Right. And you're going to let me help you. You're going to let me help you push that out, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. If not, you done. can make me pay the man. <laughs> done. He's, I, know you, I know if I don't, I'll make me pay the man. <laughs> so, so look, yeah. It, it uh, as I've explained to you once before, there's a weird hypnotic connection that develops between staff and, and yeah. recruit. So you just yeah. whatever you say, it's yes, staff. <laughs> whatever it might be, yes, staff. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever it might be. Piazza, my Piazza messaged me on uh, on Instagram. I want to say two day two days ago. We we were going back and forth, and the way he ended it, he was like, "Yes, staff." I kind of like. Who are you talking to me? <laughs> it's, it's just, oh, it is. I'm telling you, it is in us. It is in us. It's yeah. you know, mission accomplished, yeah. guys. Let me give the list yeah. of people that are out there with us. It was Mel B., Danny Amendola, uh, Hannah Brown, Tyler Florence, Kate Gosling, Dwight Howard, Montel Jordan, Gus Kenworthy. I can explain who everybody is if you want. Nastia Lucan, Carly Lloyd, Beverly Mitchell, Kenya Moore, Mike Piazza, and Scaramucci and Jamie Lynn Spears. There's the group. There's the group of us. Yeah, uh, that yeah, was the day before yeah, we went in and uh, it, things started happening. <laughs> when your life changed yeah. forever. Uh, Danny is a wide receiver for the, or I think a slot receiver technically for the Patriots. Hannah Brown, yeah. uh, Bachelorette. Tyler Florence is the uh, food truck guy on Food Channel. Kate Gosling, Kate Plus 8. Dwight Howard, Laker. Montel Jordan, this is how we do it. Uh, Gus Kenworthy is a skier. Nazi Lucan is the gold medalist in um, uh, the, the unparalleled parallel bars and, and uh, gymnastics. Carly Lloyd is a soccer player. Beverly Mitchell, actress. Kenya Moore is housewife. And then Mike and Scaramucci needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, How Scaramucci long did it take to cast? I mean, did they do it like Drew was thrown in two weeks I, before? I don't think that you would. Do you know what the casting was like? Were you involved with that? No, no. They don't no, involve us at so. all. You know, same with the UK yeah, series. Think so. just like, hey, we just show. We don't typically, we don't find out who Sue until you guys get off the bus or the train or whatever, or whatever uh, vehicle you guys are getting out of. So everything is fresh for us. What do you don't want to support your research. I, I, I totally get it. And, uh, and I will just say, I think I can say this without divulging too much. When they pull the hoods off our head is when they find out who we are. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, oh, my yeah. goodness. All right, so let's talk about uh, human trafficking. That's where I want the focus of our day to be spent. Uh, how did you get involved yeah. in this topic? Why this particular yeah. aspect of human tra trafficking? Why should yeah. people see the film? Yeah, so when I, get, when I got out of 2016, I still felt this need, this desire to serve in some way. I, I've talked to a lot of other veterans who 
who feel the same way when they get out, that sense of purpose. There's a difference between having a job and serving. So I wanted to find that way. And there were things, different things that were thrown my way. So I, I, I would go to inner city schools and, and, and juvenile centers and talk to the kids and hang out with the kids and bring them out of the hood and take them to nice restaurants to try to expose them to different things. I did prison work where I went into prisons, men and women's prisons and spoke and shared and, and did outreach there. And then uh, the, the reoccurring theme that kept on popping up was human trafficking. Where And I wasn't chasing it. It was like it just kept on coming my way. In uh, 2016, I want to say a nonprofit by the name of Without Permission reached out to me and asked me to be part of a rally. They had heard my story and asked if I could come help out with their efforts in human trafficking. And a year later, Lindsay, I believe her last name is Snyder, she's the owner of In-N-Out Burger, her nonprofit reached out to me, Slave or Nothing, and asked me if I would be willing to help out with a fundraiser that they would do it. So it just kept on coming up. And then uh, and then fast forward to about 2017, 2018, I was contacted by another human trafficking nonprofit profit that actually employs former special operations guys, whether you're Delta, SEALs, uh, Army Special Forces, Force Recon, and three-letter agency guys who go into other countries and rescue kids who are trapped in sex trafficking and organ harvesting, but also arrest Americans who go down to foreign countries to have uh, sex with underage girls uh, who are traffic victims. And uh, that was a big eye-opening experience for me, especially being a father. I'll never forget, you met my wife. And uh, when I was pitched the opportunity to go do this, they sent me a video and me and my wife watched it. And she was just like, go. <laughs> I know you're done with the SEAL thing. I know I told you you can hang that up, but you need to, you need to go do something. And, and so I went down there and as I said, it was an eye-opening experience. And where the gears began to turn for me is I, I went down to Dominican Republic one year in 2018, July 2018 to be exact. And when I was down there, I was in this particular slum that where the parents would sell their daughters to sex traffickers. And, 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 and the traffickers would take their daughters to the northern part of DR where the tourists would come and these tourists would have sex with the underage girls. We know that the profile for Americans who travel, the profile for men who travel abroad to have sex with underage kids are American men. And so this took, took place in DR. And when I was in this slum, I couldn't grasp the con concept as a father of selling my child to a trafficker, no matter how desperate I was. And our liaison recognized how kind of confused and perturbed I was. So he pulled me aside to help me better understand. And he took me into this chapel in this slum that was no bigger than the size of three toilet stalls. And at the end of the chapel was a dead baby, six month old baby in a casket. And he explained to me that, that the baby died because the mother wasn't getting enough food and water. So her breast milk dried up and therefore uh, the, she mixed formula with the local water and that's what killed the baby. And he used that as a teaching moment for me to help me to understand that he was like, this is their plight. I'm not justifying why the parents do what they do but they're desperate. So for them, it's either we sell our daughter to these traffickers or all of our kids die. And again, that didn't make it wholly understandable to me, but it did give me a sense of, a, a sense of understanding. And when I left uh, DR on that trip and got back to the States, as soon as I landed, I had vo a voicemail um, by Michael Bay's producing partner, Mike Case, and he said, hey, Michael's looking for you because he's starting his next movie, Six Underground, with Netflix, and he wants you to be the lead consultant on it. And it was through that conversation, that situation, I got hired into the job, and it was like these two worlds collided. Here, this world of human trafficking that I have been working in, in and out for about three years, and then film and TV that I had been working in during the same time. And in my mind, I was like, you know what? I can go down to South America and other countries and even here in America and kick down 100 doors and rescue 300 kids. But at the end of the day, there's going to always be 100,000 more kids that need to be rescued. What can I do to have a bigger impact? And when we go overseas to do missions, I'm sure we discussed this while we were on the show, but when we go overseas to do missions, you, there's something called winning the hearts and the minds of the locals. And we use civil affairs uh, uh, units as well as PSYOPs units, and they'll go into the local town and they'll, you know, rebuild schools, they'll hand out soccer balls, they'll, they'll you know, they'll rebuild soccer fields and so on and so forth and to win the hearts and minds so that the locals can help us do our job, help us find the bad guy or not hide the bad guy or so on and so forth. And so that's what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to create a film, a piece of media where 
where I could put out into the into the ether and people can watch and be compelled to do something. They can watch be shocked and say, oh my God, I didn't know that was happening and get engaged in a fight because it's a global issue. Um, human trafficking alone in America generates about 32 billion a year, globally about 150 billion a year. So it's a massive enterprise on track to surpass the drug trade. And so for me, this, that's why I felt like I could have the biggest impact. And that's kind of how this film was birthed. It's, it's so, it's, you just, you, should, you, you can't imagine how massive it is. That's wild. Uh, you know, we yeah. think of human trafficking, we mostly think about labor, sort of slavish labor, slave labor, yeah. and the sex trafficking. You don't often think about the organ tra trafficking and, and how that whole world works. It always seems so uh, yeah. fantastic. Like, well, maybe yeah. maybe somewhere out in the periphery, but uh, your yeah. your movie brings it home. Did, did you write, yeah. produce, and direct it? What, what were your roles in this? Yep, I uh, I wrote, produced, consulted on, and directed the short film. And you know, I, I, and the reason why I wanted to make sure I had my hand in it because I wanted it to be as authentic as possible. That film is based on yeah. true events. It's not some fiction horror film that I pulled out of my butt. It's based off of true Ugh. events. I don't want to give away too much, but there's an event that took place August third of two thousand and fourteen. I encourage anybody after they watch the film, but don't do it before you watch the film. Uh, Google it after uh, after you watch the film. Just Google August uh, 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 third, two thousand fourteen, and then genocide, and and you'll see Ugh. how that connects to the film because there's some events that took place at U.S. Yeah. the U.S. Congress and even uh, the U.N. Uh, classified as genocide, and the film uh, deals with the victims of that genocide. So it's based off of true events. It's not something I pull out of my ass. <laughs> Duh. though we wish it were just that i wish it was somebody's pulled out their ass and not something real yeah, yeah. we um yeah. we we've been doing some uh, supporting eliza blue who's a friend of ours that does a lot on sex trafficking and sort of the and, he, and even when you start to raise awareness about the full spectrum of what that really is you know this the idea of how can i say this in a way that's accurate that it's not just the over-the-top explicit sex trafficking that is is try there's all kinds of other flavors of it out there that people get manipulated yeah, yeah. into and 100 uh, uh yeah and on that note you know you brought up a great point you know and when typically as you said when people hear human trafficking they just think of sex tra trafficking for the most part yeah but as you mentioned there's sex trafficking there's labor there's drug trafficking i interviewed a guy a few weeks ago i just released his interview today on youtube he was trafficked for he was lured to mexico from venezuela and he was, once he got there with the promise that he would be smuggled into the U.S., he was put in a house with a hundred other uh, traffic victims and the kids were used to move wow. drugs into the U.S. So they were used as mules. So that's another form of trafficking. And then obviously, you know, there's labor, as I mentioned, and, and organ harvesting, which the film touches on. But then you have other facets like blood trafficking. There's a story out of Cambodia, uh, international story that was on the news a few weeks ago, uh, a few months ago, of this businessman from China who traveled to Cambodia and he was essentially abducted and blood trafficked. This gang kept him strapped up and kept drawing his blood. For what reasons, no one really knows, but he finally escaped. So there's all these different facets. And, I, and even this time when I even hate to use the word human trafficking, it's, slave, it's slavery. It's slavery. I think human trafficking yeah. is the uh, is the PC way of saying slavery because at the end of the day, that's what it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and and it, the and I I I don't know why it's not more uh, present um, to mind. You know, I, I it's so in the shadows, and and yet it's yeah. so big and so much and so obvious when you start looking for it. I, how do they keep it so thoroughly in the shadows? Well, they're, they're intelligent, you know, just like, you know, uh, drugs and, 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 and you, we don't see, well, now, depending on what I was talking to a buddy of mine, a SEAL buddy of mine who was in Canada uh, this past weekend, and he said that there was a law passed where uh, uh, you could smoke crack out on the street and not essentially get arrested. And, and, yeah. and so there's crackheads on one corner and, and uh, drug dealers on the other corner. And so, you know, but if we go yeah. back to the to the 80s and, 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 uh, and the 90s, you know, a lot of that, a lot of the drug dealing was done in the shadows as well as, and then you go back even further when we talk about the mafia and other stuff that was done back then, all of that stuff was done in the dark and in the shadows. Uh, it's these, the thing is, and what I tried to really focus on on this film was how intricate and intelligent these traffickers are. They're not idiots. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a uh, Egypt, Cairo, Egypt is considered the organ harvesting capital of the world. And in 2016, there was a, uh, a, a bust uh, of an organ harvesting ring. And of, of the 45 people who were arrested, the majority of them were doctors and nurses. And they also confiscated wow. millions of dollars. So you're not dealing with this, this typical criminal who's not intelligent, who's in the corner, who's dirty and that's just grimy and unmanicured. We're dealing with people who are high level, highly educated, smart, well-connected people. Um, and, and, and that's why it's able to lurk in the shadows because of the fact that these people are not idiots. As a matter of fact, and, and this will be a, a short tangent I'll go on before I give the mic back to you. Uh, there's a story out of, well, we're starting to realize uh, through source reporting that traffickers are starting to realize uh, that it's more lucrative for them to tra traffic organs uh, and it's safer than it is for them to traffic people for sex. Uh, because on the black market, uh, a clean heart or lung can go for as much as a, it starts at a hundred thousand uh, dollars. A kidney or liver mm. starts at uh, excuse me, clean heart or lung starts at one hundred thirty thousand dollars. A liver or kidney starts at a hundred thousand dollars, and corneas of the eyes start at thirty thousand dollars. So if you take a whole person, we can conservative, conservatively say that that person can go for five hundred thousand if they sold their organs are sold on the black market. Mm. The average sex traffic victim. It takes them years to make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for their trafficker, for their pimp, for whatever yeah. the term we're gonna yeah. we're gonna put on it. So it's more lucrative for them yeah. to organ harvest, organ traffic people, and it's safer because they don't have to worry about their victim being catching disease or being uh, being you know, dealing with an undercover NGO or undercover cop. So again, going back to my main point, these people are intelligent and they've really found different ways to work the dark web. I mean, there was a girl who was trafficked from a Dallas Mavericks basketball game this year. It was a national news story. And she was found on the dark web. She, she went to the Dallas Mavericks uh, playoff game with her father, went to go use the bathroom, never came back. Father went to go look for her, couldn't find her. Security went to go look for her, couldn't find her. The cops came, couldn't find her. Wow. Cops wrote, it off as, wrote her off as a runaway. Um, the parents, a few weeks later, employed a human trafficking nonprofit to help find their daughter. The human trafficking nonprofit went on the dark web <laughs> where these people work and move. The dark web is real. It's interesting because you'll meet people who don't even believe the dark web exists. It does exist. Oh, and no, it exists. His profile was on the dark web. Yeah, it, her profile was right there on the dark web. She was being sold for sex. So a sting was set up and she was rescued, but she scarred for the rest of her life, of course. But these people are smart. And the, some of the traffickers that were at that house when the sting was carried out were at the game that day. So we're not dealing with idiots. Oh my God. And, and it, and it just is so, I mean, you have to think in terms of who or what kind of person can say traffic somebody for sex. It's a kind of person for whom life has no meaning. They could just as easily disassemble somebody and sell their parts. It doesn't matter. In fact, killing them might be a little more uh, humane in terms of what they're, right. what they're capable of doing to other human beings. Yeesh, awful. Uh, all right. Yeah, so, I, Susan, uh, I, I, yeah. so I was going to say, I, uh, I, I, I did a, a ride on with a border patrol agent a few years ago as I was getting into the human trafficking side of things. And, you know, he's seen some horrific things. And, and, and I remember one day we were, he showed me pictures uh, of, uh, of, of two dead babies and the babies, their organs were taken out, taken out. They were cut open. Oh, my God. And the babies, the babies were stuffed with drugs in order to cross the border. And, you know. Oh my God. The traffickers were uncovered because the dogs went, you know, once the dogs came in and were sniffing around and sniffing, they finally realized that that baby that swaddled in the car seat is not alive, that it's not asleep. That baby's actually dead. And so, so you don't realize, it's hard for people to realize, especially here in America. See, I've been all around the world. I was born in Nigeria. I've seen evil out there. I, I've been to war. I've seen evil. And I think that the everyday average person, one of the reasons why people don't believe this stuff exists is because people do not fully understand, most people do not fully understand the depth of evil, like how evil pe other people can be at times. So hence the title of the film, The Unexpected. Wow. Yeah, uh, Susan, I heard you reacting with the mic off over there. She she was uh, affected by your film, so oh yeah, for sure. Do you want to I mean, react? Because uh, you, I was just thinking. Yeah, we were in New York last week, and they were reporting a twenty year old who had a wellness check, 
and they fe- went into the apartment and found suitcases full of body parts. Mm-hmm. So I think it could happen here too. Well, it could happen here, but, but you said it might have been some weird sex thing. But well, I mean, but the, but it the makes point is, we think, aren't. Wow. We we have a hard time. We think we know what these things are, but we're not exposed to it. We 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 hide a lot of stuff from ourselves in this country. A lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Death and dying yeah. is something we hide from ourselves. Violence, you know, the reality of what people do to each other. We just we hide it, and. Um, yeah. Well, we're very fortunate you to know. live in the United States and yeah. not have it as bad here, but I'm sure it exists in yeah. the U.S. Well, I mean, well, the, just, yeah, the U.S. prosecutor, we, we pro, uh, I want to say, I, don't quote me on this, I'd have to do it, uh, have to reread up on this, but the first organ harvesting case was prosecuted in the U.S., I want to say about three or four years ago. So it, it has happened in the U.S. And we know that Americans who are desperate. See, this is something that, especially as it relates to organ harvesting, most healthy people don't realize. When you are not healthy and you need an organ to be able to last another year or two years, you're desperate. You'll be willing to do anything. 4,000 Americans die every year because they didn't get a kidney in time. You know, a healthy person, I don't understand what it is to be desperate or to, to really need a kidney in order to survive or my child need a certain organ in order to survive but you know there are people in the u.s there's a story in, in this sorry i'll be on this quick tension of, of a western nation this would be a good example of something because a lot there's a lot of stuff that is open source that's out there but there is some stuff that's not so uh, i want to say it was 2017 maybe it was 2012 so many years in my head i might be mixing up but anyway if you google costa rica israelis uh, organ harvesting broker and 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 uh, and kidneys, all tons of articles, open source reporting to come up on this. But there's a story where uh, there was an Israeli broker in Costa Rica who was broker, brokering kidney deals. So essentially, people mm-hmm. in Israel who needed a new kidney, they would fly to Costa Rica. The broker would find a poor person, a poor and desperate person in Costa Rica that act, was willing to sell their kidney. And there was an exchange that was done and note the kidneys illegally were sold on a black market. So that's an example. You do get Americans who will travel to other countries where the, 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 the uh, transplant, transplant laws are less stringent or, and, and, and or where there is not as much oversight as there is in the United States. So that does happen 100 percent. It has happened. Yeah, people. Uh, again, I think sometimes when people are desperate for an organ and they're, you know, when we get to the point where you have organ failure and you need a transplant, you may not have long to live. And people, when yeah. they become desperate, literally just go, "I, I don't. Let's just get. It. I don't care where it comes from. They don't. They don't. They don't want to yeah. know. Unfortunately, yeah. and yet what they might be yeah. contributing is something awful. Caleb, do you want to yeah. react to it too? I know you were yeah. moved by the film as well. well. Watch his film. That's literally what you were just saying, Drew. That's that. You got to go watch. Everyone has to watch that film tonight. It's it. Yeah. it you're right on topic. Yeah. So there there's we always going to be a whole lot of people didn't who leave need an organ organs. In Jordan. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, from, from what I remember, oh, I can't go into detail. He almost did though. Somebody. We almost. can't go into detail. <laughs> that was the first thing I said though. No, no, there's more. That was more the first to be revealed. Thing I said. I said. I think yeah. you might. You could have left the kidney no, there. More to be revealed. We'll tell the whole story in January when when we're promoting your yeah. book and uh, talking about what really happened in the oh desert. So yeah, when when yeah. is your book coming out again? This new book. Uh, you know the publisher. She sent me a time frame, but she didn't send me an exact date yet. So first thing I'm doing after I get out of this is I'm emailing her so we can nail down that date. But it's going to be 2023. All right. Good. All right, excellent. So we'll come back around and talk about that then. Uh, well, listen, my friend, thank you for all you do. Thank you for this project. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you did for us out in the desert. Do you want to see if anybody has a question for him? On the- I, I don't know. How, we don't. They're not screen calls, so there's no way to really do that, is there? Unless you want to put, if you have a question for Remy, if you want to put yeah, it, put it on the restream. couple re- things we can. Put it on the restream. Put, you know, if you're on the restream, put the question up there, and then I'll call you up I on the- I think they can uh, tweet it, too, or make a message. Uh, okay. I'll look at the tweets also here. I'm looking at that. We might have a couple of questions or- uh, Casey keeps saying Semper Fortis. Uh, what, um, where did you serve when you were in the military? Uh, I try to be vague, but all over the Middle East. I've been to Southeast Asia, and- uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> he's been he's had to do some stuff. Yeah. Um, wow. He is yeah. he is married to a primary care practitioner uh, whom I've yeah. had the joy to have met. And you guys have three kids or four? Four, four kids, three sons four kids. And, and what are the ages? What are the ages? Uh, my oldest is eight. Yeah. Uh, then my next son is seven. My next son is three. And my daughter is going to be two next week. And, and his wife does a full-time medical practice, which is, and you're away a lot of the time. So it's insane. Yeah, it's yeah, so yeah. much, so stressful. Yeah. And I see your it's kids on Instagram. They just seem great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, they're awesome. They're awesome. They, I mean, they're my motivation. And they're one of the reasons why, you know, I made this film was because, you know, I want to leave, when I leave this earth, I want to leave it better than, than it was when I got here. And I know that with all of this stuff going on, unless somebody steps up and does something, and, and, and brings awareness to this cause, the world is just going to get worse. And I don't want to leave this world type of world to my kids. So they're, they're my, they're my uh, big motivation and inspiration for why I do what I do. I hear you. Do you want to tell them about the school? That's great. As we wrap up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my school, I opened up, a, a co-opened, a, a co-founded a school in Muskegon, Michigan. It's a school that caters to uh, inner city kids. It's right on the, uh, it's right on the water, uh, the Great Lakes. It's uh, a maritime themed charter school. So uh, we're open. Uh, we got kids in classes right now. And our goal is to raise up the next generation of leaders, take kids who come from an impoverished background and give them the opportunities that I didn't have. You know, uh, teach them how to swim at a young age, <laughs> you know, give them a great education <laughs> so that that way they can expose them to uh, other realms. We're going to have we're going to have doctors come to the school and, and engineers and lawyers and entertainers come once a month so that that way we can expose the kids to other avenues so that they see a way out. It's great. It's great. I see a few questions on Twitter. So during the break, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question of Remy, we'll keep them a little longer and then you can. Talk about COVID after that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still a little confused how we do that. There's how, a little bit. I mean, we've had a couple questions. So you will where, be where? on the, uh, on the, in the, in the comments. Oh, in, in the comments the, on the side. Yeah. In the, okay. Uh, I'll find out who those are. I'll look Twitter for them there. All right. Can you hang on, Remy? Can you stay with us? Hey, 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 hey. that's my time. I'm, I'm All right. easy. All right. <laughs> hang on a few minutes. We'll take a little break here. We'll come back with some questions. Be right. For a long time, I've been talking about the holy grail of skincare, Genucel, and the amazing results that both Susan and I have seen. I'm a big fan of Genucel's Silky Smooth XV. It's a moisturizer soaked right into my skin instantly, and with its immediate effects, I saw fine lines and wrinkles visibly disappear within 12 hours. Susan loves Genucel's vitamin C serum, infused with the purest vitamin C, absorbs to the deepest layer of the skin thanks to Genucel's proprietary skincare technology. I am a snob when it comes to using products on my face. The dermatologist makes a ton of money from me. But when I was introduced to Genucel, I was so happy because it's so affordable and it works great. I was introduced to the Ultra Retinol Cream, which I love at night. All the eye creams are amazing. People notice my skin all the time, and I'm so excited because it's actually working. And right now, Genucel has bundled my favorite products and Susan's for you to try today for up to 60% off retail pricing. That's right. Save up to 60% on my favorite Genucel products today. Just go to genucel.com slash Drew to see what's in our bundles and receive an extra 10% off at checkout when you enroll in their personal concierge at checkout. That again is genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash D-R-E-W. All right, sorry guys, we're still trying to figure out how to get... Uh everyone up who wants to ask a question you guys got to raise your hand yeah melissa uh, asked on twitter uh for remy all right let's get remy in here remy a daily kid here we what go. was the best thing about being a seal uh the guys the, the, the guys that i was able to work with you know our, our the vetting process yeah. to become a seal is, is very stringent and but it's a brotherhood mm -hmm. you know there's a saying when you suffer with somebody you know, it's easy to reign with them because there's that shared suffering, that's that shared that bond you had that grew out of suffering. And so that was it. You know, I've, I've been I was blessed to work with some of the greatest, most intelligent, unique, crazy guys on the face of this planet. <laughs> so that was it. Yeah. And and then uh, JDS is asking, how can someone help? Are there good NGOs or nonprofits? What What do you recommend if somebody wants to make yeah. a difference? A uh, fantastic question, and that's why I made the film for that very question to be answered. Yeah, I made the film so that people could watch it and be inspired to do something. 
I spoke at a conference um, this weekend and in the, the end of the conference was all about that. How can you help? Well, it's do what you can do with what you have. That's the easiest answer that I give everybody. If, if it's as simple as donating to a nonprofit, my suggestion is do your research. There are a lot of nonprofits out there that say that they do work in a human trafficking space and they really don't. They're just one big marketing machine. So do your research to find the right human trafficking nonprofit. Make sure that they're actually doing something with the money that, that they're receiving. Uh, if you're good at admin or counseling or you're good, you know how to work the cyber web. And you're, I mean, I'm saying work the cyber web, which might not be the most grammatically correct term, but if you're good at any of those things, find a nonprofit and say, hey, I'd like to volunteer to go down on a trip and do aftercare for girls or kids that are rescued out of, uh, um, out of a, tra a trafficking situation. If you're good on the web, maybe it's you know volunteering with a nonprofit to search the dark web and, and to expose these these organ harvesting and human trafficking rings, not just nationally but internationally. Uh, and if you have some type of tactical skill and you have the right mindset, I always emphasize you have to have the right mindset because when you go into these countries and you see these things, if you don't know how to control your temper and your emotions, you will make a situation worse than it has to be. You got to remember, you're not dealing in your own country. You're dealing in a foreign country. You're partnering with the local police. And so you must be able to stay professional and maintain your bearings regardless of what you see. So if you have that ability, then find the right, you can find a nonprofit that will take you in. So those are the, the four off the top things that you could do. Again, my big one is whatever it is that you feel you could do that can make a difference. For me, it was going overseas and then coming back and saying, you know what, I'm going to make a film. That's where my giftings are. I'm a filmmaker. I know how to tell a story. So let me do it that way and engage in the fight that way. So that's what it all boils down to. Find what you could do. And uh, yeah. So. And Susan, will you put, they're asking on the restream for specific links and stuff. Will you put all the links down on the restream for us? Mm -hmm. Um, and the name of the film and the, you know, Ramey's website and stuff. Yeah, go to drdrew.com. I just put the link on the restream. I'll put it over in Rumble. Just go to drdrew.com. Click on the link to Remy's show and all the links. Caleb has lined them all up in perfect order there. I was just wondering, Casey's saying a bunch of stuff. Did he raise his hand? Uh, hang on. I won't, before we get over there, I, I, well, let me see if he did. Uh, yes, he's got his hand up. I'll get to him in a second. One more question. I don't know if this is appropriate or even what they're talking about, but I'll just ask it. Uh, why was Operation Talon halted? Do you know what that is Operation or whether that's Talon. even a question that we can answer? Yeah, T-A-L-O-N, uh, Talon. Like, Oh, no, 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 not, not, uh, not, all right. not ready. And if it's an operational, one thing I try to do is I try not to talk about, I'm, I've been out of the military since 2016. And, you know, one thing that has always bothered me, even when I was in the SEAL teams, when guys who've been out of the SEAL teams or any special operations unit goes on the news or TV or whatever, and they're talking like they're, like they're in today. You know, a lot of things, tactics, mm -hmm. procedures change every year. And so when it comes to operations and why something didn't happen, I have no clue. I'm not ready. My security clearance is expired. So I sort of talk to me to speak on stuff that I'm, that I'm totally disconnected from. That makes sense. Casey, uh, you're up. Hey, Shippy, uh, Dr. Drew, uh, Semper Fortis, gentlemen, Semper Fortis. All right, Remy, um, yeah. here's the thing. I, I remember uh, Trump wanting to um, uh, declare the, uh, the cartels in Mexico uh, as terrorists. What happened to that? Why aren't we doing that? Uh, I... In all honesty, I don't know. But what I can say is that I, as I'm, I think I mentioned this, I can't remember, I've done a lot of interviews lately, so I can't remember if I mentioned this earlier today, earlier in this interview, but I did interview a guy who was trafficked in Mexico. He was from Venezuela and and he was lured there. Now, as far as whether, they, he, he doesn't specify whether they were cartel. He does say that they were traffickers, so they could have been cartel, they could have been gangs, they could have been other nefarious figures. And uh, essentially, you know, there were a hundred people in that, particular place. And one thing I asked him at the end of the interview, I said, what is your message to America? And his answer was, you know, you, we need stronger borders. He was just like, you've created, because of the lack of security, there's this environment that's been created on the border where these traffickers are aware and they're able to entrap people. And so his message to everyone was, if you're going to try and get into the U.S., one, be safe, be smart about it, realize the risks of trying to cross whatever country you're coming from through Mexico into America. 
And and two, you know, to the Americans, we have got to, you know, you got to strengthen your borders because the fact that there's a lack of strength on our borders is creating this, it's creating this atmosphere. It may not be the right word, but it's creating this hodgepodge where traffickers are driving and and they're enslaving people. So as far as that, I, I can't speak on that, but you know, uh, I know some some. It could turn political. For me, it's not about politics at the end of the day. For me, it's all about human beings. And, uh, and, and, and yeah. That, that's the part that, that I find sort of frustrating with uh, government generally, is there seems to be yeah. just sort of a massive denial about human motivation, human reality of human behaviors, and the reality of yeah. the policies and status, uh, you know, of, of things like the border that profoundly affect people and they just deny it. They pretend it doesn't happen. And that's very frustrating to know that these things they're doing, I don't care what they do to correct it, just, but let's just be realistic about it and try to try to make it better. Whatever that means uh, to pretend it's not happening. It just, God knows. It's it's the same thing. I look at our streets here in Los Angeles, the same idea. They're just, it's not happening. Well, it is. And hundreds of thousands of people are paying the price. I didn't vote for Trump. When people get desperate. I, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't understand why, after all the work we went through to put up the, you know, the wall, it just came right down the minute we changed into a new. Yeah, that's why government is. No, and, but uh, why? And now we have all these problems. Like it, it actually did make sense. I mean, I hate to admit it, you know, but, um, you know, protecting this country is really a good idea, and these people are just like, you know, they're so they're just out there and on the on the borders they're just they're just like cat and mice you know they're gonna get caught they're gonna be used they're gonna they're they're leaving their babies out there it's just it's just here we just said they're stuffing their babies with drugs it's like crazy caleb you had a question oh yeah yeah so i uh i watched the film i thought that was it was just so i actually finished watching it about five minutes before the show began today so i'm still just and kind of almost it's it's really intense to see this shaken up close yeah it's very (laughs) very like jarring there and so one of the questions that i had had so i'm i'm uh what am i i'm 34 now and so the kids in my generation we were raised with this very strong fear that there were these kidnappers or snatchers that were around every corner that were going to pick you up and traffic you Mm -hmm. but then years later as i've seen you know more documentaries and reports about this it's turned out that that was just kind of like almost like a a newer form of satanic panic where Mm -hmm. the truth was almost all of these infamous abductions that you hear about were just mentally unwell people that were acting alone not really an organized group mainly because abducting an american child is so risky for trafficking gangs that they would get caught it'd be in the media it'd, it'd be a huge deal so yeah. I wonder, what are the countries that are out there that are actually driving the highest demand for these black market organs? And how are these sellers finding buyers, especially because a lot of these buyers, if I think about the people who would most likely need organs, you're thinking of old, I'm thinking of like older, older wealthy people. They don't know how to use the dark web. So how are these, these yeah. sellers finding their buyers? How is this whole, like, how does it work? Like, what? Well, a lot of it is a lot of it, believe it or not, is done on the Internet. Um, it's, it, in Egypt, that, as I mentioned earlier, is the organ harvesting capital of the world. I was clicking on something because I was I wanted to get the exact name right um, of this uh, this this uh, uh, trafficker who set up this website in India. But in India, while that's popping up, I could talk about uh, Egypt. But uh, in Egypt, they're using things as simple as apps. They're using chat forms. They're using draft folders of emails where a trafficker will, you know, open up an email account and just work within the draft folder of that email. They're using social media. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, during the pandemic, the shutdown, uh, recruitment online increased 22%. I think on, let me pull up the statistic, on Facebook alone, there was a, 20, alone, there was a 25% increase of, of, of recruitment and a 95% increase on Instagram during the lockdown. These are proven statistics facts. Okay. So a lot of it is being done on the internet. It's done, it's being done in DM, uh, direct messaging on social media. It's done on other apps. It's done in chat rooms. It's done on emails. And, and as far as the organ harvesting thing in Egypt, that's all they use. Right. Uh, now in mm. India and, the, and, 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 that's what a lot of organ harvesting guys do internationally as well. In India, last year, 
and I'm reading this verbatim because this was something I came across in doing my research and reading and, and, and preparing for the film. But um, on my last year, there was a Nigerian man in India named Gregory, Yer, I'm going to spell his name, Y-E-R-M-A-D-E-H, that ran an online ki kidney selling ring for three years before he was caught. He preyed on people in mm -hmm. India who were desperate and made a fortune. If, you, if, if anybody wants to mm -hmm. you know, look into this, all they got to do is Google Nigerian man, Gregory, Yer, just type in Gregory, Y-E-R, uh, India, uh, kidney selling ring. He created a website. And if my memory serves me right, that website would double as like a real estate site. And he was finding desperate people who were willing to sell their organs. And that's how it was happening. That wasn't on the dark web. And so the dark web is, I would say the dark web is used more in the US, right? Uh, more right. so than in other countries, because in other countries, there's not as much oversight as it relates right. to social media. Um, and there are these so many fake accounts. I did. I mean, how many times I get fake messages every single day from right, um, right. different yeah. things to sign up for. And let's keep in mind that remember back in the day before the internet, what was used in the U.S. You go and walk it down the street, you look at a, a telephone box, or you look at a, 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 a light pole, and there's like a flyer. Take a take a number and call modeling agency. Right. Come and, and if you were looking for a modeling job, that was used to a certain extent too. Or not all, not, not like, I don't want to say like 100% of it, or 90, right. 80, like a random number, but people did use that in a way to lure girls to certain places for abduction and mm -hmm. other things. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's like, it was like widespread, like a million girls a day that was happening to, but there was right. a fraction where that was happening to. Social media is so vast, right? so wide, the internet in general, and these people know how to work. This guy who I just mentioned, Gregory, he was a computer science engineer. He knew how yeah. to engineer websites to do this kind of stuff. That's that's but the then, unfortunate thing is they know what they're doing. Yeah. It, it's these cyber security. Yeah, they know how to hide it. Yeah, and so it's yeah. are they are the typically is it the sellers that are seek like they are looking for buyers, or do they like do they already basically have they have their the the product? Unfortunately, it's like they have the organs that are ready and they're searching for buyers all the time. Are they like searching through like? getting hospital records of who has money and is looking for this, or is it the buyers that are searching out the sellers in some way? It's a combination of both. So it's, and it's also oh. like word of mouth, right? So if you, if, if, for example, in India, what was happening in this particular organ harvesting ring, when people, when somebody showed up with money, hey, I got in a scar on it, hey, I got X amount of dollars, and they're right. in a low caste system or they're in poverty, what are they going to do? So I just right. ask, how'd you get, oh, I gave up this kidney. Okay, how can I put me in connection with this person, right? So now a database is being collected. On the other end, there's once that website that this guy Gregory set up is up and running, he has a collection point for people to reach out. So people right. who were in need of kidneys, they had a point of connection, and obviously he was connected to other people in India as well. Again, right. this was another multi-million dollar organ harvesting ring that was uncovered, and so it, it's it's it's. So there's, there's three, and that's another thing I right. missed. There's three facets to the organ harvesting side of things, right? You have the people who are willing and desperate, right? Like like I mentioned the story in Costa Rica. I um, you know, mentioned India. I mentioned, you know, uh, uh, Egypt. Africa is a big, uh, you know, big right. area for organ harvesting, right? So you have the people who are desperate and willingly selling an organ. That's one facet. Another facet, you have the people who are tricked. Right. And there's another story out of India where a woman, and I, I think I shared this when I was on your podcast, Dr. Drew, there was a, a woman who was in a low caste system and, and she received the message, there's a job for you. I'm, I'm kind of condensing the story for the sake of time. There's a job opportunity for you in New Delhi. Uh, just come here, we'll put you in an apartment. She went to New Delhi. This is all open source. This story it was international news. She goes to New Delhi to this apartment. Her, her uh, employer, I said that in air quotes, told her in order for you to start work, but you got to remember, just the idea is like somebody saying, hey, you hit the lottery. Right. Like this is right. the mindset of some of these people because they're so poor. In right. order for you to start work, you need to go get a medical checkup tomorrow. She goes to get a medical checkup, right? She gets undressed. She overhears the nurse tell a doctor in the other room, this girl is giving up these particular organs. Because human trafficking is a mm. big thing in India in and of itself, as well as China, as well as Africa, so many places. You know, because she was aware of the organ harvesting and human trafficking issues in India, she knew what that was about 
got dressed, boogied out, reported the clinic oh. and the employer to the police. The police raided the clinic and uncovered a multi-million dollar organ harvesting ring that had been going on for years, okay? So wow. that's another facet. Wow. The other facet that I touch on, that the film touches on, is are the force. People right. who are abducted and forced. And, and as I said, I don't want to give away too much. What I'm going to do uh, when I post the film tonight, I'm going to put, I'm going to put something, I already wrote it up, it's called True Backstory, where I break down the backstory of where these, these victims have came from in this, in the film's right. particular story. And I put a link to actual, an actual article that breaks it all down and UN's involvement in the Congress so people can see that this stuff is real. This is not fake. It's, but my whole focus is on wow. people who are abducted and taken from right. force. So this stuff does happen. Sorry for cutting you off. No, no, no. That is just, it's so yeah. wild. And I think that it, part of it is because it's so shocking that it's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And I, yeah. I realize that it's so shocking because any, everyone on the screen here and everybody that's listening, we don't associate with the types of people that can do this. Like our, these aren't our friends. These aren't our family. We don't know them. And so we can't even imagine just the depravity and evil here, especially Drew, who's like a doctor, imagining how many medical doctors have to be involved in this whole thing to do the surgeries, to do the transplants. Like there yeah, are actual the medical doctors I, with I degrees that are a part of it. Stunning. And I, I, it's, I think I'll also that people, they... Everybody is against human trafficking, but I don't think that they realize that a part of fighting human trafficking is fighting against poverty because people who are in poverty be, get desperate. And then that's, exactly. that's what yeah. creates this. Like there, there's always- exactly. The other thing- yeah. the other wow. two, you, Sorry, sorry, you brought up a great point sorry, I can, that I brought up, sorry for cutting you guys off, <laughs> in my talk this weekend. Traffickers prey on the vulnerable. The, the people who are the most at risk to become traffic victims, are people who are vulnerable, people who live in poverty, people who don't have parents. Those are the those are the people who are most likely to become victims of all. And so if you brought up a great point. One of the ways to deal with this is to in some way deal with poverty. You know, and not, not and not just here in America, but it, like worldwide, which I don't know the solution to that, but that's one way to combat human trafficking. And I hate to use human trafficking because that's the PC word, slavery. Right. I, I mm -hmm. thank you for what you're doing. This is, I'm, I'm just, I'm shocked. And it's, I, I just, I remember, I remember the shock that I felt after I, I, I watched, I forget which it was an overseas documentary. It was in a different language with subtitles that I had to watch that really opened my eyes to, uh, it's, I, sh I don't have to be so fearful of being kidnapped over here because everyone lives in such fear overseas because it happens so much. They prey on people who don't have voices. They prey on people who aren't on social media yeah. and who are in, living in poverty. Right. So it's, I, thank you for everything that you're doing. This is an amazing film. Yeah. Uh, and uh, two things, I, uh, I, I guarantee you, Caleb will be on the link this evening reading the article that talks about the, the truth of the story. Yeah. Number one, you can find yeah. him there tonight at nine o'clock Pacific. Well, email, I'm gonna email it to you right now. Uh, I also think that Americans, and I'm going to bring it back to America again, because I don't think that we're immune yeah. to this situation. We're not. We just heard about a Mavericks, I a think, kid at a Mavericks right, game. Right. Yeah. I think the more desperate we yeah. become when the stock market falls, when people are, you know, losing money and people are just trying to survive after COVID and stuff and the nefarious stuff that can start building up from mm -hmm. the bottom. And mm -hmm. I, it just, I'm, it's sort of a warning signal, you know, that mm -hmm. we have to, yeah you know, be very careful, yeah. very careful. Yeah, I look, there's a I lot agree, of kids yeah, left who haven't gone back to school. Yep, I agree with you 100% and two things on that note. One is a story that came out national news about two weeks ago, this woman, she was in Walmart and uh, she was in the aisle looking, looking at shoes with her, I think her 12 year old daughter. And, and she had went online prior to that and studied the signs and symptoms of somebody who seems to be a trafficker and she looked up from the shoes and there was a guy who was in the, in the aisle, like behind another like table of shoes. And he had his camera up in a very conspicuous way. And he had been recording her. Oh, yeah. So she pulled out her yeah, phone yeah. and started recording him. And uh, he ran off. Well, she recorded him for a period of time because he kept recording her and her daughter. She was actually, he was actually recording her daughter. And she reported it to the, to the manager of, of the Walmart. The police came. She showed, sent them the, the police the video. Police walked. They were able to identify him. The guy had just been released from prison. 
class one sex trafficker, uh, mm-hmm. sex offender. He had raped and molested underage girl. Right. So this does happen in America. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, Ugh. is the biggest consumer of child pornography in the world, which is pornography that is developed, produced and created with traffic victims are mm-hmm. Americans. We drive the demand. And when I say we, I don't mean me. We drive the demand for content that's created with sex traffic victims, whether that's child content and even pornographic content. Porn, Pornhub is known for having potentially traffic victims on their site. Same thing. A lot of people think that they're watching OnlyFans and certain people and they think it's innocent or watching certain porn and they have these porn addictions and they think, oh, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not doing anything. But do you know that the person on the other end of the screen may be a traffic victim and you're funding this activity? So, you know, America drives the demand. And I can't really speak on the numbers as it relates to organ harvesting, how much we drive the demand. But we know from a statistical standpoint that we drive the demand for content that's developed and created with sex traffic victims, specifically children as well. We're the biggest consumer of it, Americans. So this problem is here. Terrible. We are contributing to it. Well... I can't thank you enough for the project. Let's get all the stuff out there I again. I love your passion. Yeah. The f- uh, go to, where should we go to see the film tonight? Give me the, again, the specifics. YouTube. Mm-hmm. Uh, go to, uh, go to YouTube. Um, yeah. Go to, you can go to YouTube. Remy Adeleke is my YouTube channel. Uh, if you have a hard time finding that, you can just go to my Instagram. Uh, and on my Instagram, it's the link in the bios to my YouTube channel page. Or if you, you know, if you hard for you to spell my name, Remy Adeleke, then just go to YouTube and search the unexpected film by and just put the unexpected film and it'll pop up. There might be some other stuff that pops up called the unexpected, but you'll eventually get yeah. to it when you'll see that poster that's been up here on the screen. And if you're just listening, it's R E M I A D E L E K E A D E L E K E. Remy, again, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it'll be fun to go out and uh, see how the world receives us in January. Uh, and there's yeah, the yeah, unexpected. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. Uh, be sure to check out the article after you've watched the film. You're going to be compelled to sort of go deeper into the real story and what you can do. Thank you for spending time with us, my friend, and uh, hope to see you very soon. Hey, thank you, Jock, Dr. Drew. Uh, thank you, Mrs. I'm always pronouncing your last name. Pinsky? Pinsky. Pinsky. I know. I, I screw yeah, your last name. It's no big deal. I fucked you. I screw your last name up, too. So it's all, it's all I, good. I, so good. This is Pinsky. I, 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 Oh, I'm sorry. This is a military thing. So I'm sorry, Susan. I just missed it. I know. I know. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, thank you for having me on. Kayla, thank you for having me on. God bless you all. Much love. Thank you for helping me get the word out about this film and about this important topic. <laughs> there you go. Time to pay the man. <laughs> whoever, doesn't watch the, whoever doesn't watch the film, I'm going to make sure they pay the man. <laughs> That's right. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you so much. We will all follow you uh, and stay in touch. And uh, yes, for sure. Uh, And Casey, I know you're putting the um, the all the uh, uh, credits up, but I wanted to spend a few minutes, if you don't mind, because I always like to kind of recap what we've been doing here with all the different interviews we've had this week and last week. And uh, if you'll give, do have a few minutes to do that? Do you mind? Oh yes. Oh no. Yeah, I th- like you said Casey, right. so I thought I, I didn't know you were talking to me. I'm sorry. Caleb. Did I say Casey? <laughs> Caleb. Right. I beg your pardon. I also I think in Casey. The reason Casey was in my mind is I want to get to the calls and take a couple of yeah. calls also, because um, I'm assuming they're going to be calls in the sort of COVID area. So or hopefully about this. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, we we I think we did a thorough job on this one. Um, Good so, guy. Oh, yeah. How could you stop? I couldn't stop. Talking to him? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I listen. I wanted more. I know. I, forget about then, that. I didn't then, want, Susan, yeah. <laughs> go to my website. Go to the the Dr. Drew podcast, and you can have an hour and a half with him and he's I. He's not as cute in a podcast. He's a, okay. he's fun to watch, and he's so smart, and I appreciated you having him on. Okay. Uh, Thanks for letting us right. have him as a guest. Of course. Of course. Oh, well, no, I'll do anything for the guy because he, he, he needs would... to come back once the, the show airs, too. For sure. We're going to bring fun. everybody back through here once that show goes on the air and let everyone talk about their experiences and stuff. To the extent we may have to wait till the, I don't know how many episodes it's going to be, but it's probably the middle of March before it all airs. So we might have to wait all the way till then to get everybody in here to see I know, talk about I know. Experiences. It'll be okay. We'll figure it but, out. Uh, in any event, so Dr. Bhattacharya yesterday, and uh, we had Ed Dowd, I believe, last week. Let me double check that. Isn't that who we talked to last week? 
Uh, oh no, we were out of town last week. Was the issue? It was Ed Dowd the week before. Yeah, was it last week? Yeah, I was from New York. That's right. That's right. Uh, and so I, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of way I'm thinking about things and what I think we've learned. And I'll take a couple of calls also, which is that it's just increasingly clear. I don't know if you noticed when I was talking to Dr. Bhattacharya, we had what I'm convinced was a Chinese operative on our Rumble rant. I mean, there's just no doubt in my mind that's what that was. What he was championing, what he was saying repeatedly on the stream here, if you guys that were on the Rumble right yesterday noticed him, was he was espousing these over-the-top declaratives of, uh, of, of uh, the, uh, the virtues of lockdowns. And they were so crazy and over-the-top, it, it was like clear to me that it was not somebody that uh, is from here or who's been thinking about this. It was just some sort of a a bot who is just repeating shouting in caps well not all in caps and the point being is when i called it out as a chinese operative it just stopped which i think was fascinating uh <laughs> secondly it was not someone who was watching the show because we were talking about how the fact that the world health organization and our own public health officials were persuaded by voices like that that is that is the thing that in the in the setting of all the panic and the uncertainty that they heard people talking like that of the uh, over-the-top virtues of locking down a society, that was, I, I don't know if that was done intentionally to to really cripple everybody or if that was well-meaning, but whatever it was, the people in power were grotesquely persuaded by people that had no business having a voice even in this situation. And that there was more to be done. I I'm reading a book by a guy named Woolhouse. It's called The Year the World Went Mad, talking about doing localized sorts of containment, which is what we had always done and what we will always do, I trust, but will not if we don't look back on this and are very critical of the mistakes we've made. But there's ways to sort of protect vulnerable populations. There's ways to get the vaccine out to the vulnerables. We should have done exactly that with monkeypox because we are so inebriated with the notion of equity we literally don't we're not able to call out the the risk group so we can protect them we must let that go i will just point out again that if you have three cases with covid you have a 20 year old male you have a 45 year old beast diabetic and you have an 85 year old female there's no way you're going to get the same outcome in all three cases that's not the way medicine works there's going to be three different outcomes three different biologies three different natural histories it's just how it works. So to be obsessed with equity in a setting where there is diversity of biology and an infinitely complex circumstance, you can't have that as the sole prism through which you see things. You can have a goal of equity of distribution of resources for sure. We should always have that. But to, to have equity of outcome as a, a some sort of um, blinded um, priority so many people are going to get hurt, and we we effectively did that. The data is just still rolling in on how much harm we we did. Let me bring uh, Joe. Communist plot, I, dear. No, I don't know what it was, but it, it, it hurt people immensely, immensely. What's up, Drew? Would you call that Caleb? equity Caleb. Uber Alice? Equity Uber Alice. So it was safety Uber Alice, <laughs> equity Uber Alice, vaccine Uber Alice. But but it, the reason I I am uh, so uh, vocal about the the prism through which they see, you know, unidimensional approach, that's never okay in medicine. Never, ever, ever. It's how you hurt people without taking in the totality of the context and the risk reward of anything you do. When I was teaching medicine, that was the thing I pounded into the, the residents all the time. Like, the, defend your decision. Tell me why you made it have a backup plan and you better be able to have both and be very clear about them if you just did it because you were focused on you know treating a spirus keat and that's all you concerned yourself with and not the totality of the patient circumstance i i had no patience with that jody what's going on you have to unmute yourself i see you hi dr hey drew there. thank you so much for having me up you caleb bet. um thank you as well i just sent you a bunch of dms um hi. So I really appreciate um, the topic, Dr. Drew. We're a little engine that could uh, non-for-profit apes for change. And um, one our next project actually is on human trafficking. Oh, great. So Excellent. I was very, very excited to um, get the opportunity to see you. I, I follow you and follow all your spaces. So I'm usually in here, but this one was especially 
you know, to the heart for us because it's such a huge problem. And, and some, the president and vice president of our non for profit were able to speak with someone from right. um, underground operation, underground railroad. So, so tell, tell us where people can go. A, tell us more about your project, where they can go to learn more. Um, so if anybody wants to follow it's apes for change. Um, I don't know how to like post in the nest. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. I'm a little illiterate when it comes to that, but I sent everything to Caleb actually, okay. um, a ton, a ton of information. So if you guys could get that out as well, um, we're, we're really making good strides. We, we have a whole community of activists, um, is it, retail is it, investors. Is it the number yep. four or is it F O R? It's apes for change. A P E S, the number four. Number four. Okay, got it. Apes for change. Got it. And uh, we've done a, a bunch of really, really, really cool projects, and we're gonna change the world, Doctor Drew, one project at a time. All right. <clears throat> but I, you know, I just I, when I saw the human trafficking, that's our next um, project right. that we're into right now, and. Uh, Hopefully we can bring more awareness to this. So beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm gonna I'm gonna not take up all your time, okay. but thank you for that. And Dr. Drew, I love you. Thanks, Jody. Appreciate your work. Keep doing it, my dear. Uh, this is uh, Aaron. Let's get Aaron up here. See what Aaron has to say to us. We'll try to get some calls in. Uh, Aaron, what's up? Aaron. Hello. Hey there. Hey, we do. Hey. Oh. I called you a while back about my wife and her oxygen problem and stuff. So I had a second question I get to ask you last time. Okay. And I was wanting to ask what you think about Adam's theory about like being around dirt and whatnot. Well, we live on a farm <laughs> and me and my kids are always messing with the animals. And then I work construction also. Yeah. And like, we all live in a small kind of house. So yeah. when we get sick, we all get sick. Of course. But my wife always gets the worst of it. Mm. And me and the kids don't really get that sick. Mm. And I was wondering what you think about like being around. We have hogs and cows and dogs yeah. and cats and all right. okay. the whole thing. So so here here's really it, it's a it's a little bit more nuanced than Adam presents it. What what Adam has this sewer rat philosophy about strengthening our immune system and our overall constitutional system, and uh, Caleb is laughing. To some extent, that's right. We need to be exposed to a certain amount of pathogens. We need to gain immunity. We need to see viruses. We need to see allergens. Our immune system needs to be sort of conditioned to all that. Now, we don't need to see anthrax and brucella and really serious illnesses and trichina, trichina, uh, um Trichuria trichuris and things that farm animals get. We don't, no, you don't need that because that will make you really, really sick. And your wife, if I remember, has some chronic underlying conditions. So exposing her to anything that can decompensate that is sort of a different story than just saying, hey, we want to expose young and developing systems to allergens and pathogens. But that doesn't mean we want them to get septic scarlet fever. That doesn't mean we want them to get tuberculosis, right? There's a, there's a happy medium here. I think the really what he's advocating against is protecting people too completely from everything. Being raised in a bubble is not a so-called healthy way to he be. He doesn't use soap. If you he live doesn't. on a farm, you have to use soap. Yes, you do. And and so and there are But he doesn't live on a farm either. Right, exactly. And so there's a lot of stuff that you, you know, kind of it's kind of healthy to get exposed to, yeah. but it's a it's not right. a, it's kids not, need to get sick. And, but there is a there's an upper bacteria. limit to that. You, you don't no, want to go true. too crazy. And it that. depends on the person too. Yeah. So you don't want to be eating, you know, you just, I think just, he's probably having a fight with his wife over our, who's who's not being clean enough. Okay. <laughs> okay. Tay, what's going on? <laughs> Dave? I see you there. You're unmuted, but we don't we can't hear your voice yet. Hey. Ah, shoot. Oh, Tay. Oh, Tay. I don't see them as a <laughs> speaker. Okay, I'm gonna try solution here. So. Ta ta, Tay Tay. <laughs> uh -huh. There's a solution. What's up? You see that one, Caleb? Oh, there we are. Solution. Hello. Hey there. Yes. Hey, hey, Doctor Drew. Man, I loved your show back in the day. Love Line was one of my favorite shows to watch. Um, Thank you. I had a question though. I, I feel like you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in the world and. 
And I know that the, this child trafficking is probably the biggest thing in my mind mm-hmm. that I see wrong with this world. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole Epstein thing mm-hmm. and all the people that's connected to him, is there, is there anything that we could do as a, as a group to try to get this information into the right hands? Th- this being what we were just talking about today or yeah, well, I'll tell, the, you, tell you what well, I would do. Tell you what I would do. I, 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 I am not sure I fully grasp where this lives and you know what to do about it yet. And I, I and I, what's the black web? Well, that's the Caleb has to explain that. That's to the everybody. onion router. You don't, like, the, I don't you don't, even know you don't want to know. Uh, right? Am I right about that, Caleb? The T O R, the onion router. It, exactly. Wow, Drew, I'm actually impressed. Wow. Yeah, Susan, you, it, there's mm-hmm. there's nothing good can come of it. Unless you're like, yeah, you're there, like there's a, a, a large oppressive part. government that you need to escape. Right. There's a huge part of the web, bigger than the part we actually use, that is available to sort of governments and intelligence agencies. And then people find their way onto it and traffic drugs and people and all kinds of horrible stuff, guns. And it's just a horrible place. Yeah. And uh, my Catherine, you spent a little time on there. Yeah. So just, <laughs> yeah, that's how I found would, out about it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, but uh, so I, I would tell you to follow Eliza Blue. Does Eliza have her Twitter handle? Susan, do you know what the, it is offhand? Because uh, Eliza it's just Blue, Eliza. She's, Eliza knows maybe. Uh, I don't know. She's I, very. Involved I texted her today. I tried to get her to come on um, Twitter Spaces. She, she is a great source of uh, guidance and inflammation, and really sort out. of makes it her business to help connect people that want to do something. So I, I would go over to Eliza's. I, I am no check. expert in this, and so I, I would send you to people I know that are really doing a lot of work with this. So I would say that. Okay, so guys, uh, I will wrap this up here. Uh, let's talk about what's coming up next week. I know we have, uh, let's see here. Hmm, I have to travel next week. Monday, hmm, what are we doing Monday? Is somebody coming in here? Guys? Didn't Taking I see calls. Michaela Peterson coming no, in? No, she can't come back till November. Oh my God. Oh no! That I know. makes me so mad. I know. That I know. Makes we me almost very, got her. Very, very, very angry. I know. Uh, oh. All right. Because she, yeah, I know. It wasn't right. her fault though. It was a scheduling well, mix-up. She was ready. No, to it was not her fault. Yeah. That, that, that's my point. We had her booked, and now we lost her for months. Eliza Blue, B L E U. B L E U is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Blue, I put it on Eliza screen. Eliza Blue. Okay. She's. Oh, you did. <laughs> I'm so slow, Caleb. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know. It's I maybe she's leaving the country or something. Who knows? But she has her own stuff she's doing, of course. Yeah. And are we yeah. having the schedule for have, Wednesday with Kelly? Yeah, Wednesday we have a show. We have Tuesday we have a show. Tuesday we're gonna do take callers and we can do we can take calls on Monday too if, if right. Caleb's up for it. I'm up for that. Uh but I'm wondering have we got any potential guests coming in on Wednesday we can talk about? Because I know he would I don't he, know yet. Yeah, I don't have that. We don't have that book yet. Okay. Yeah, we're currently we're working on, on getting a we're getting a fertility or actually a women's biology expert in here who has some increasing some interesting data on uh, the vaccine. Yeah. Now this was a whole thing about the breast milk, the mRNA in the breast milk. I don't know what to make of all that yet. I need to talk to somebody who really has some updated data on what's going on here and what what do we need to be worried about, what do we not be worried about. And so still, I think, I think I'm going to try to zero in a little more on vaccine therapies. Uh, as I said, I'm still vaccinating the over 65 and certainly the over 75 year olds. Most of my patients have been waiting on Omicron. Interestingly, most of them either had Omicron or want to see what the experience is in humans, which thus far seems okay. Uh, I'm convinced that them having had Omicron gives them better immunity than the, uh, than the vaccine itself. And that was something I kind of Maybe we should get Monica Gandhi back in here too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think it's true. So good. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, okay, Caleb, can you do that? Uh, we're I'll look at my Tuesday. calendar uh, off the air. I'll I'll check on it, but I'm I'm pretty sure I know at least Tuesday, okay. Wednesday for sure. And we okay, are do. also out on Getter, G E T T R. Yeah, we had a few or, people over there. Okay, right? yep. oh, it's your new Getter. profile. Look at the restream. See if you have any. Getter.com slash user slash Doctor Drew. So it's. G E T T R dot com slash U S E R slash D R D R E W. Oh, interesting. Why have influenza B cases plummeted? Uh, they think it's because of the uh, behavioral changes associated with COVID. That's what we think. Uh, all the influenza drop off has been thought to be due to that. 
But uh, the question, I believe, I believe, and I don't have any evidence for this, but I just think it just makes sense to me. I, I talked about this early in the pandemic. There's, there's sort of an ecology around viruses. In other words, much like on a savanna, you'd have certain predators push out other predators. I think viruses compete in some way and they can outcompete each other. And when they do, uh, other viruses drop down. That tends to happen during a pandemic. So I th feel like there's some ecology there. It might just all be our behavior, but why... Why would why would it be so far down and unable to con we weren't able to control COVID really at all and yet we drop influenza that doesn't make sense to me fully so I want to see some data on that we are concerned that there could be a very serious influenza outbreak this year so make sure to get your flu vaccines if you're 65 and above get the full I haven't gotten one yet I know I haven't either I'll bring them home I got to remember to bring them you got uh, we still get the lower dose one not quite at the big daddy doses yet. We'll be there soon. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody wants I've me to, had one every year and I don't to ever get the flu. Talk about uh, Scott Adams and fentanyl. What would you like me to talk about fentanyl? It's in everything. It's a catastrophe. Oh, yeah, the nerds. What about the they nerds? They found them in kids' uh, candy. It's everywhere. It's, nerds. It's, yeah. They found it in, mm. which is ridiculous. They did. I, What's oh, that? yeah. I, 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 I hear that. that I, I hear that about that, that every that year. That was a bogus. Well, it's, yeah, it was a bogus it's, story. It, yeah. uh, nobody's going to be putting their expensive drugs into your kids' candy, so it, it, that's like a very, 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 yeah. very small worry. <laughs> I would. Another thing that they yeah, made me afraid yeah. of as a child was that everyone was putting drugs and right. razor blades no. in all of our candy, razor blades, and snatchers, razor blades in your. Yeah, it never happened. Uh, yeah, so it's funny go. when I when my kids were little and we lived like in a cul-de-sac and you know in a little little housing area, you know kind of up here in the hills of Glendale. And I used to remember like never seeing any kids outside, you know, mm -hmm. like riding their bikes or playing or doing anything like a bunch of kids living there, but nobody would let their kids go outside. It would, I always found that to be very strange because I grew up in a time when you would just go outside all day and then come home. Mm -hmm. And um, so I get it. I mean, people were seriously afraid. And I mean, you have to be, I guess. Mm -hmm. Your mother made was super paranoid about super you. Super paranoid. She he wasn't allowed to go outside. <laughs> no, I did anyway. I just did I just get on my bike and go. <laughs> but I mean, I I guess now your kids will be kidnapped more more often, so it's probably smart. I don't know. I I hate to see that. Kids All right, need let, to let have me look fun. at the rumble rant. Try to answer uh, your questions. Are uh, got the flu shot? Didn't get the flu? Did get the flu? Yeah, it's not a hundred percent effective. Yeah. Uh, and you can't get the flu from the vaccine because there's no virus in it. I think also no now, real virus. since we've all worn masks for so long, our immune systems are weaker, so it's probably better to get the flu shot. Well, that's what they're saying. Because once it goes out, it's just Right, gonna... that's the concern, is that uh, it's going to be a, a Like really on airplanes flu and stuff. We'll see. Uh, and uh, over at Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley, if you didn't get your flu shot, you have to wear a mask. <laughs> But don't worry about wearing While a helmet when you ride a bike. a bike. Yeah, don't worry about a helmet when you're riding a bike, though, because that's that's that would be foolish. Oh yeah. So the the again the um, inability to contextualize risk and re relative to other serious risks. This is just wow. Uh, maybe I don't know. All right. So anyway, uh, we'll be back in here <laughs> on what. Monday. This is Thursday. Monday. Back on Monday. Well, we're going to check Caleb's calendar, but check hopefully Caleb. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And uh, we'll maybe a little bit late on Monday if we come in on Monday. And we'll Monday. take all your calls because you guys have the best shows. Yeah, we love doing calls. Yeah. All right. We Thank you so much. love your questions. And we'll see you all then. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help. 
out of probably 90 kids, I was one of the four main actors in the Christmas pageant, mm-hmm. and my character's name was Steve, and I, it was some overweight character, and I was basically the comic relief, and I specifically remember standing up there hearing probably two or 300 parents and grandparents laughing. It left some weird impression <laughs> on my ass. And I've been I... fucking chasing that <laughs> dragon ever since. It is weird. I'm never going to reach the top. Nope, that sixth it, grade it, Christmas pageant. It, it, I think it, that was it. 